Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Rena Kapoor. I'm one of the faculty advisors for the Rebellious Psychiatry Conference. Um, so for those of you who are here for Psychiatry Grand Rounds and weren't with us earlier in the morning, I'll just say a couple of words about uh, what RebPsych is. Um, essentially, it is our attempt uh, within the Department of Psychiatry and the medical school to create a formal space for important discussions that maybe we weren't having enough of beforehand, um, that we wanted to bring together mental health professionals, activists, consumers, artists, and other people to consider what we think is a pretty complex intersection between mental health and social justice. Uh, we want to talk about social contributors to mental illness for sure, um, but also about how our profession's role um, and our obligation uh, in promoting justice uh, and creating the kind of world that we want to live in. Um, to paraphrase a uh, United Nations official, what we want to do is move the conversation beyond chemical imbalance about mental illness and to consider imbalances of other types of power, of privilege, of liberty, and of wealth. Um, and so we're here today um, to, to live in that space together, hopefully to hear things that are a little bit provocative and to consider our work in a different way. This particular lecture uh, is our website keynote address, um, which is also the Bertram H. Roberts Memorial Lecture. Um, and I know that some of you would rightly point out to me that there's probably nothing less rebellious than naming a keynote address after uh, a white man who was a benefactor to the university. Um, uh, and I get that. But let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Roberts so that you can see uh, why we're so grateful for the support and why he actually uh, fits right into the mission of what we're trying to do here. Um, so Bertram Roberts um, was a psychiatrist here at Yale um, in the early 1950s. Um, and probably what he was most famous for in his short career um, was publishing uh, a book with Jerome Myers um, that came out in 1959 called Family and Class Dynamics in Mental Illness, um, in which he had studied families from dis different socioeconomic groups in the New Haven area and looked at outcomes related to mental illness. Um, and when he passed away, unfortunately, uh, in an accident at quite a young age, leaving behind his wife and two infant daughters, um, the American Journal of Psychiatry said Dr. Roberts was loved and esteemed for his decency and his sense of social justice. Um, as often happens um, when there is a great man, um, the great woman sometimes gets forgotten. And so I just wanted to say also uh, a few words about Mrs. Frances Roberts, um, who was Dr. Roberts' wife. Um, so. Frances Roberts uh, was distinguished in her own right, um, had a degree in early childhood special education from Yale, um, became, uh, had a number of roles working in the Connecticut Department of Mental Health, um, and actually was involved in being esta uh, establishing CMHC, um, and held another, uh, a number of roles in prominent national mental health and public health organizations as well. Um, in 1955, um, Mrs. Roberts' family established the Bertram H. Roberts Memorial Fund um, in Dr. Roberts' honor, um, which has been used over the years to support a number of social justice um, and social health um, projects. Um, and so you can see on the left, um, that's one of our former trainees, Anna Fiskin, with Mrs. Roberts. And the other photo is from just last night. We were fortunate enough. Um, to be joined for dinner um, by the Roberts daughter, Maggie Barkin, who's also here today um, with her cousin, Jerry Garfield, and we're very grateful that both of you could make it here today. Um, so with that, um, I will turn things over um, to Neantara Anderson, who's a medical student who's been part of our RebPsych organizing committee, um, who is going to then introduce our keynote speaker, Michael Denzel Smith. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm incredibly, like, like Rena mentioned, I'm, my name is Neantara Anderson. I'm a third year medical student um, here at Yale. I'm incredibly excited to introduce Michael Denzel Smith, um, author of Invisible Man Got the whole, whole, world, whole World Watching, as well as numerous other articles in publications like um, the Washington Post, the New York Times Book Review, um, the New Republic. But, I don't want to just read off a list of his accomplishments, because I'm sure we can all do that on the website. website. Instead, I want to share a story about the first time I heard Michael speak. It was shortly after Invisible Man Got the Whole World Watching came out at a bookstore in Boston, Massachusetts. The reading was wonderful, and the comments were great. Um, but what sticks in my memory is a moment from the Q&A session. A number of people of color asked questions about Michael's reading and commented about how his writing resonated with their experiences as people of color. And then a white woman stood up and asked that question. It went something like this. Thanks for talking about and sharing your experiences, but what I really want to know is how I can be a good white ally. I've heard this question asked, by, white per by a white person at almost every talk about race or racial injustice that I have ever been to. And to this day, Michael gave the best answer to this question that I've ever heard. He regarded the woman and said, I can't tell you what specific things to do. That's up to you and what your life is like and what communities you are part of. But I can tell you this. If you really want to be a true ally, no matter how you decide to do that, be prepared to give up social and professional capital. Because being a real ally means you will lose friends, means you will ruffle feathers at work, means you will get a reputation for being that person. So that's probably the best advice I can give you. I want us all to take Michael's counsel to heart today at this conference at an academic medical center about social justice. Ask yourself, am I willing to give up social and professional capital in order to fight for social justice in my profession, in my community, in my life? Many of us are told, this is the, I think one of the mantras of modern American social entrepreneurship, the era of social entrepreneurship we live in, many of us are told that we can do good while getting ahead. But that may not always be true. And when it isn't true, are we still willing to fight the fight? So perhaps today, ask not what you or others can gain by fighting for social justice. Ask instead what you are willing to give up and that, perhaps, will be the true measure of your commitment to the cause of furthering social justice in this country, which, after all, is still under the control of the descendants of its European colonizers. Michael Denzel Smith. Good morning. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I feel like actually we can just leave now. That's done. It's like, <laughs> that's it. That's my message. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you for inviting me to Yale, a school I could not have gotten into when I was applying to schools as an 18 year old. Um, I really appreciate it. I like getting invited to uh, different universities and stuff uh, because now I don't have a degree. I didn't finish my four years uh, at Hampton University in Southeast Virginia. Uh, and I just like to gloat that now I'm getting paid to speak to you at this university um, without having accomplished that. So it's great. Um, I bring that up not just because uh, I like breaking the tension with a little laughter at the beginning. Um, but I did not finish school. Um, and I write about it in the book. Uh, I attended Hampton University, a historically black college. I purposefully chose a historically black college to go to um, because my ambition at that time was to be sort of what I understood as like a race man. I wanted to be one of those activist type like that I was seeing sort of at like 
you know, a Cornell West and Michael Eric Dyson. I wanted to be one of those people that, that seemed like it was a, a good vocation, right? Like it was an honorable vocation to be out there speaking about the issues of racism. And I thought uh, historically black college would be a good training ground for all of that. Um, and in some ways it was. Um, but there was other ways in which I didn't realize how conservative of an institution uh, my historically black colleges and universities writ large are. Um, and in my time there, I grew frustrated. I grew frustrated with the world outside of me. I grew frustrated with the college experience. Um, but I was finding outlets. So I was both a political science major, uh, and then I spent my uh, extracurricular time being a part of the school newspaper. Uh, I started out writing opinion articles, became the opinion section editor, and then my senior year I was editor-in-chief. My senior year and being editor-in-chief coincided with a year uh, in which young black people, even before this time that we understand of like Black Lives Matter, um, young black people were being engaged in politics and social justice and racial justice through the case of the Gen 6. Uh, Gen 6 were these six young black boys in Jenna, Louisiana, who were being charged with varying charges for each of the six of them, but all going all the way up to attempted murder for what essentially amounted to a schoolyard fight. Uh, and many of us were being involved, uh, wanted to uh, lend support. There were marches, there was all, all of this happening. Uh, and I wanted to leverage my position as editor in chief of the school newspaper uh, to draw attention to it, draw attention to it on my campus and hopefully get more people activated, get more people talking about this, but more people interested in following the case, fighting for justice for these six black boys. Um, and I ran up into some uh, disagreement with my, uh, with my school uh, administrators. Uh, as I say, Hampton University is fairly conservative uh, in their approach to the educational training that they're attempting to bestow upon their, their students um, and that we were not, be, we were being taught about past battles. Uh, we were not being taught to engage them currently. Uh, we were being taught to uh, dress up in our nice suits, uh, be presentable, uh, get good jobs, make lots of money, um, and then you could sort of donate your money to causes that you find. And I was like, so who exactly is supposed to fight all these causes if we're all just making money? Um, but uh, their approach to students getting involved in this case was uh, frustrating. <laughs> um, so a couple of fraternities on campus uh, decided that they were going to host a rally the same day that there was a huge rally happening in Jenna, Louisiana. Um, and they wanted to do it in our student center during a time that we, colloquially, it was 12 to 2, and we knew that from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. there was a DJ in the student center, like people were hanging out, everyone's having fun that's an opportunity to take advantage of this large crowd to say, hey, this is now a rally. We're going to like, politicize this moment. Um, and originally the dean agrees and everyone would go through, get all the paperwork, uh, blah, blah, blah. Then like a couple days before, they're like, you can't do the rally during that time uh, because we have a pep rally for the football team planned at exactly that time and exactly that place. Even though you did all the paperwork, we told you that you could. Uh, and I was pissed, <laughs> I was pissed off that they were taking this away from us, right? Like we had been chastised as a generation that was apathetic, that did not care, that was not activated, that wasn't politically engaged. And here we are doing it. Uh, and there's no support. There's no institutional support for us doing this. 
And so I was preparing also our first issue of our newspaper. We did weekly uh, newspaper. And so, you know, I took to writing. We like investigated the whole thing, did the proper journalism thing, and like investigated all the claims. Like, you know, there wasn't, this pep rally had not been on the student calendar before, but like all of this stuff, the coach told us we don't do pep rallies the day of a game, like doesn't make any sense. Um, so we, we were lied to, whatever. Um, I took to the newspaper, I wrote, for the first issue. Um, some things that I, f I feel like I wouldn't say now, it's just like I'm a better writer and also like I could say them differently, like I could hurl these insults in a way that maybe like weren't so direct. Um, <laughs> but I also, remember, keep in mind this is like 2007, it's like two years after uh, Kanye was on TV talking about George Bush doesn't care about black people. So I was kind of like, Kanye was still cool then, so like, <laughs> <laughs> so he had an influence on me. And, and so the very first sentence of my op-ed in that first newspaper of the year, which set the tone for my relationship with the administration was, Hampton University hates black people. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is great, I, you know, it, it, it certainly was like, you know, attention grabbing for, for my readers. Uh, and my, the other line that I'm still proud of, but honestly just wouldn't write it quite the same way, was that uh, the soul of Ronald Reagan rests his head on the dean's office at night. Um, <laughs> I still think that's good. <laughs> and, um, um, anyway, I, would, I, I say all that to say that like my senior year, I was engaged in a fight where I felt like I was fighting both national causes and things on campus. And I was like very much in an activist mode. Um, but that coincided with my own breakdown. Um, and I don't know how much to attribute to how much uh, work I was doing then, uh, how busy I was. Um, how I wasn't making time for much else. My girlfriend at the time could tell you how much, how little time I was making for other things that weren't the activism I was involved in on campus, the newspaper, other things that arose from, from that. Um, but what I can tell you is that in the spring of 2008, stopped going to classes, was sleeping until 2 p.m., was drinking, way heavier than I had. Um, I honestly, I didn't even, I'm such a square, like I didn't drink uh, until I was le legal. Um, just because I was scared of getting drunk, like I would, had real weird notions and still kind of do around drugs and like and, <laughs> intoxication and stuff. Like I thought being drunk was gonna be like an out of body experience. Like I was gonna be watching myself do shit that I <laughs> wouldn't normally do. Um, that is not how it is. But, <laughs> um, but so it took me a long time, but then spring 2008, I, I kept a bottle of vodka in my freezer and like was drinking constantly. Um, and then the panic attack started happening. Then I smoked weed for the first time. And remember, I'm a square. <laughs> like, I didn't do it when I was a teenager in high school. Um, but the second time that I smoked, I had a massive panic attack. I mean, I was in a car with some friends and we smoked and I didn't even know if I was high or not. And then I went back in my apartment and my roommate was there and I told him, you have to take me to the hospital because I felt like my heart was beating outside of my chest. And we had a whole back and forth and, and I just like spent a night like coming down from it. Um, but the panic attacks didn't stop. They weren't as bad, that bad, but they didn't stop. Uh, didn't graduate because I didn't get the credits that I needed. Um, spent the entire summer in my apartment staying up until 8 a.m. and then sleeping a few hours and then waking up and having panic attacks and then watching movies to calm myself down and then doing the cycle all over again. And then eventually um, I had a breakdown in, in front of my parents and my dad said, uh, it's one of the, 
talk shit about my dad, but it was like one of the most emotionally intelligent moments that I've ever had my, experienced my father where he said, it sounds like you're going through some kind of depression. And like hearing that word was just like, oh, that, that's exactly it. That's exactly what's happening to me right now. And from that moment forward, it's like now that I know, like I can address this. Uh, so started going to therapy, uh, I think it was like twice a week then. And started opening up and started talking about what all was going on, what was happening in, in up here. <laughs> Uh, and got to talking about my own survivor's guilt. So what happened when I was 12 years old is an older cousin of mine, uh, Dimitri, um, who was 17 at the time, was shot and killed. And it certainly had an effect on me at the time, but I, we didn't talk about those kind of things in my family. It's like you have the moment, you know, the funeral, you cry, and then past that, the way that we dealt with things is like we laugh through the pain. And uh, I didn't much feel like laughing. Uh, so I didn't know if I had anyone to talk to about the pain I did feel. And I recognized then talking in therapy and getting, these, this, getting this terminology, like I have depression, I have anxiety disorder, I'm experiencing survivor's guilt, that I had also experienced those same things when I was approaching graduating high school. Um, it's, it's these major moments in my life in which uh, the understanding that Dimitri never got to experience those things come to bear on me. Uh, and I feel, why me? Why am I allowed to do this? Why is he not here and able to experience the same thing? Why is he not here to celebrate me doing it? Um, and I'm saying all this just, just to bring down the mood of the room. <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is that I was carrying a level of trauma that I wasn't expressing. And I think that that's true of so many of us, is that we're carrying trauma that if you are not privileged enough to be able to have access to mental health services or people who have destigmatized mental health services enough to like, uh, seek them out for you, we are all carrying trauma already before we enter any room. And then we are creating new trauma for ourselves, uh, especially when you are engaged in the work of social justice, because every day what you're up against is these forces that are entrenched uh, in each of our institutions and in each of our social interactions. And microaggressions feel way bigger than what we say they are. And I think about that now in the context of the last few years of racial justice uh, movement building, because that's what I've been writing a lot about. Uh, and I think about it, I mean, I think about it, uh, you know, sort of in what kicked it off uh, for this generation is the killing of Trayvon Martin um, and just the, the reaction to seeing this young boy, uh, fresh-faced, innocent, and, er, and knowing that either you knew someone who was like that, uh, you were someone who could have been Trayvon Martin, and the effect that that had. But I think about it a lot more when I think about the events that happened in Ferguson, Missouri. Because I went to Ferguson. I wasn't there in the initial part, but I went uh, right as they were going to announce, or when there was speculation they were going to announce uh, whether or not they would charge Darren Wilson with the killing of Mike Brown. And I spent about a week there. Uh, and I spent time with people who had been in the streets for months. And I was there 
and at all the pictures that you've seen and like whether if, even if you if you've been to Ferguson maybe but like all the pictures that you've seen it still looked like that months later there were still police in riot gear there were still tanks they were still patrolling with M16s uh, the most vivid experience I remember was like maybe the first or second night I was there was uh, every night they held a protest outside of the uh, police headquarters in Ferguson and it was just really strange juxtaposition of all of these folks standing outside protesting this killing and then uh, a thing across the, the street that said season's greetings. Um, and it was just, it was hard to sort of reconcile these, these images, but there's a line of police at the police station. They've all got their batons and they've all got the guard up. Um, and they played this game of cat and mouse where like any moment in which protesters advanced like a little bit, the police would charge, they'd grab a couple people and then they'd retreat. And then maybe 10 minutes later, they'd do the same thing over again. And they did that all night. All night long, they charged, grabbed a couple of people, and retreated. And, and I mean, I, I don't even know necessarily how to process that for myself. And then I'm thinking about the people that experience that every night. Like not like the people that were getting snatched up and then the people that had to witness their friends being snatched up. And then I was in Ferguson again uh, in the year anniversary of the killing of, of Mike Brown. And again, because what happened was they shot another young black boy on the same day. And so again, those pictures that you see that happened again. That happened with the tear gas. I ran, <laughs> I, I, the tanks, everything. And walking past the M16, that shit is scary. Now imagine doing that for months and then a year later doing it again. And I just think about all the trauma that they're already carrying from uh, existing in Ferguson, Missouri with everything that we know that was going on there before Mike Brown was killed and the level of police harassment that, was, that existed there before Mike Brown was killed. And then the day that Mike Brown was killed, seeing his body laid out in the street, uncovered for hours. And people, I, I, always, I say, <laughs> the first thing that came to mind was lynching because that's the purpose, right? right? You left the body hanging from the tree because it's a warning. You leave the body in the street because it's a warning. Mike Brown stepped out of line. He stepped out of his place. And now it's a warning to that community that this could happen to you too. And now think about walking around with that knowledge and think about what you're carrying, what you've been carrying, and what new traumas are being created. What was striking, though, is how they were able to find joy. And I, it was a, It was hard for me to experience the same thing with them. And I think in part because I wasn't there every day and I didn't know the full extent to which they needed that. They needed that catharsis. I think they needed uh, to, even if they didn't feel it, to feign exuberance. Because how do you walk through every day with that trauma, with that feeling that you could be next. And that when you're fighting for justice, you will be attacked. Not just by the police there, but people writing op-eds, going on TV, are calling you thugs. I mean, the President of the United States calling you thugs, right? Remember Barack Obama said that. 
they needed something. One thing that really hit me was that uh, they, they, they had adopted an anthem. So uh, Kendrick Lamar's To Pimp a Butterfly had come out earlier that year, and this is a song. Uh, it's an amazing song. It's called All Right. It's like, we gonna be all right. And they said that over and over again. And it's just like, you could see every time that, that they did, every time someone played that song, every time that got started as a chant, like people were genuinely like enthused. It was like this mantra, we are, we're gonna be all right. And it's like, how much of it was just trying to convince themselves? And how much of that was like a genuine belief? And I think about um, the relationship then, though, know, between politics and culture, which I think there's not so much of a separation. I think everything is, like, politics is the way that we determine how we live our lives with one another, and I think everything is a part of that, right? Um, so culture is not separate from it. But I think about the culture of hip-hop um, in particular because of the level of self-expression uh, that hip hop uh, engages uh, and allows for, and how, for particularly um, historically at least, like predominantly young black men uh, who have told their stories on record for us to hear and have told us the traumas that they lived through and told us like why they desire the things that we like then chastised them for being materialistic and like wanting the good life and wanting things and wanting to, to feel like someone. But they tell us on record that they're going through pain. It's like, yeah, Biggie was out here rapping about like blunts and broads and tits and bras or whatever, but he also talking about suicidal thoughts. Like his first album ends with him killing himself. I get frustrated when people, that Wu-Tang song, Cash Rules Everything Around Me, which is a, searing indictment of capitalism and like how much uh how much cash actually rules everything around you and the, necess the necessity of hustling um but then also the psychic effects of doing that and then the engagement with the things that help make you feel better about having to do that and i these are my like sort of lynchpins because i realize i'm getting old now because uh, i mean I'm j i'll just be 32 in november but um <laughs> I know that I'm getting old because I don't know what the fuck the rappers are talking about anymore. <laughs> um, but there is a thread that I do recognize. And so recently, a young 26-year-old rapper passed away, Mac Miller, and he died from an overdose. It's right there in his music. He is telling us about his pain. He's telling us that this is the way to escape. They're all telling us whatever, like the young thugs and, and the, they're telling us we're popping zannies. We're on my, like they're telling us that they're trying to escape something and no one's listening. No one is listening to that. And I mention that because there is a connection between what young people are listening to, what art they are consuming and the feeling of the political moment. So I think about this rapper named Lil Uzi Vert. I don't know what the fuck Lil Uzi Vert means. <laughs> what I do know is that in his song last year, he said, all my friends are dead, push me to the edge. All my friends are dead, push me to the edge. And I think again about Ferguson because I think about the fact that in the last few years, several activists have been found dead from apparent suicides. Whether or not they're actual suicides, I don't know. But several activists have been found dead from apparent suicides, including the young man from the photo I think that a lot of people are familiar with where he's wearing the bandana and he's grabbing that tear gas canister and he's throwing it back at the police. All my friends are dead. Push me to the edge. Because those people still live in Ferguson, Missouri. And that was someone's friend. And he died. He possibly killed himself 
after having to fight back against, this, against state violence. It's all there. People are telling us what's happening with them. The question is how much we're listening. I think too now in sort of preparing for today, just how little care people take for themselves. And thinking about, I don't like bringing them up because like, is, is everybody does it, but Martin Luther King Jr. Because I was watching this documentary about him, right? Like the last few years of his life. Uh, and in 1966, he went to Chicago. He was fighting against slums in Chicago, right? And people in Chicago didn't want him there. They didn't win anything valuable uh, during the campaign. Uh, Martin, like, staying in a slum in Chicago and, like, trying to fight housing discrimination and all of this. Like, they didn't win anything of significance there. And after that campaign, people around King all said that he fell into a depression, that he was questioning his worth, questioning his work questioning whether or not he had anything of value to, to give, whether he had anything left in the tank. What was all of this for? He wasn't seeing his kids. He wasn't seeing his wife. Like, what was all of this for? And his lawyer said something about it. Like, he went to go see a doctor, like a medical doctor. Um, and the doctor said, you probably need to go see, a, he probably needs to go see a psychiatrist. He said that would never happen. Because there's the feeling that it's selfish. That you are taking time for yourself when there's such a bigger fight out there. And we're talking about Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> feeling that way that he could not stop, that the fight was too big, that he couldn't take time for himself to heal. And I think about, there's a famous quote from Fannie Lou Hamer, where she said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And a lot of us hear that and like it feels like it resonates in that like we're tired of the fight itself, right? Like we're fired, tired of having to continue to fight white supremacy and patriarchy and homophobia. Uh, we're, we're, we're just, it, it makes me sick and tired that every now and every now day, <laughs> um, there's something new. There's some new catastrophe to confront. But I also think about what if she was in part saying, I'm sick and tired of literally being sick, actually being physically tired because I can't take care of myself because this work requires so much of me. And who was there for her? Who was going to step up and do that care work for her? And of course, I think about the times that we're living through right now. I've mentioned Ferguson and I mentioned, you know, Black Lives Matter and the things that I saw young people experiencing and having to, to re-traumatize and create new traumas for themselves, but they're kidnapping kids at the border. And I watched this video um, from the ACLU of this two-year-old boy who was being reunited with his mother and he ran away from her. She couldn't give her son a hug. Now think about the trauma he is going to carry from age two, from whatever they did, taking him away from his mother and locking him in a cage, and the mother. What work she has to do to repair that relationship and what she's gonna think throughout that, his, his life. And I think about what we're going through right now with the Supreme Court nomination. And how many women I know who 
some of I had to check on this in these past couple weeks, who cried yesterday through angry tears, being re-victimized, being re-traumatized, living through their own assaults, living through their own rapes, because someone has not been held accountable through, through his entire life now has the ability to sit in one of the highest positions in our country and make laws dictating the lives of the rest of us, the lives of people that he has traumatized. And I think about all we are going through. Every one of us consuming this, and every one of us who's been through it, and every one of us who's in this fight, wondering, what more can I do? Is there anything about what you've asked me here to talk about with mental health meeting social justice and that question that I did get and continue to get? It's like, what can I do? What can I do? I don't know what I can do. And in addition to that answer, a lot of what I tell people when they ask that question is, I'm just like, what do you do? Because we all have levels of expertise and talent and interest and things that we bring to the table. What is it that you do? I'm a writer. So I bring these ideas to the written word that's what I do. That's what I know how to do. We need everyone assessing what it is that they do and how to make it applicable to this fight for justice. We need everyone engaging these new ideas because things are changing. We're seeing shifts. The fact is that what happened to Dr. Christine Blasey Ford would not have been defined as assault in a different era. But at the very least, we're having a conversation in which we call it that now. Things do change, and that's because of the work that everyone does from their position. It is, it's not enough that I write these things and a few thousand people read them. It has to take place in our institutions. It has to be a complete shift. There has to be an upending. It has to be a radical reimagining of what the purpose of them are. And I think that what we have to ultimately understand is that the fight can't go on if there's no one caring for the fighters. And that's not just what I saw in Ferguson where they were connecting with people through social media in Palestine who were telling them like how to uh, withstand the tear gas and how to care for themselves after getting blasted. Or the woman who embraced them and like let them stay in their house, stay in her house and cook for them. Like that's care work. But we have to remember, everyone's carrying these traumas and someone, they need someone to talk to. Someone who knows what they're doing, someone who is versed in all of this, someone who can help them work through it. And that's where I think the idea of mental health and social justice converge, is that the fight can't continue with all of these broken people someone has to be willing to step in and heal them. Uh, and with that, I will take whatever questions you have. First stand right here.
Yeah, so the, the first time around, I didn't do that work. That was my parents doing that work and just like, I, I basically was in such crisis moment that I just would talk to whoever. Um, but having earlier this year, like finally got back into therapy and that process of, of looking for someone to, to, to be my uh, therapist, it was in part um, thinking about all of the things that I need. Um, and my therapist now is a white woman uh, but there's an openness and a willingness to not just, like when I come in, I'm not just going to talk about me, right? Like I'm not, le I, I, I know that there's, there's a lot of shit I need to like, yeah, talk about, right? Like there's a lot of stuff that's repressed. Um, there's a whole reason I'm there. Uh, but the world outside of me does dictate uh, to some degree my mood, my experience, my like, uh, my, like what dredges up things inside of me. And so I need a therapist that is not going to, uh, there, where I'm not gonna feel ridiculed for bringing in all of these outside ideas. Where I, like, let's talk about the news. Let's talk about what, especially if it's part of my job, right? Like that's definitely going to impact me and it's gonna impact the way I see myself. And like, um, so it definitely came into consideration and uh, my search process was a lot online, just like looking through uh, affordable uh, healthcare providers and then I found, uh, you know, I live in New York and I found websites where, you know, the, the um, therapists were saying what their specialties are, like what things that they're interested in, what things that uh, they want to t like be able to help people with. And there was a factor in that she was saying, like, there, do you want to talk about race and gender and all of, the, all of these things that uh, would impact your life? And so, yes, I like go into my therapist's office and we, we just had a whole like breakdown of my fears of masculinity. <laughs> and you know, like that, they, that all of that um, is meaningful. And I, I don't know that like necessarily it means that you must specialize in this, but uh, it does mean that as a healthcare provider, you have to listen. Um, especially when you're talking about people who have been victimized by these systems, they can't like not talk about the system. No more questions? I mean, yeah, I get paid either way. <laughs> Yeah, I think that, you know, my thing is that uh, I think there's, there's an avoidance. We all like enter into social settings, right? Like we have friends, we like wanna socialize, like we're social creatures. But I think that there's, there's like a feeling, at least in my experience, that when we get together, what we're doing here is not about like caring for one another. It's about our experience of like escape. It's about experience of joy. It's like, how do we just like make the space for people to be able to express themselves and their trauma like to us? Like you have to make yourself available to other people because if I don't know, then I won't. I won't bring it up because I, I'm fearful that I'm going to turn you off, that you're no longer going to want to socialize with me. You're not going to want to be my friend if I open up to you about everything that is like deep and dark and depressing. Like you, you have your own shit that you have to deal with. Like, let's just not talk about it together. I think that the like, key is that we have to recognize that we are all carrying that and we all, all need people. Um, and so maybe it's not like 
it's not like you know my night my weekly basketball games like we need to turn into a therapy session necessarily but like i need to know that those people that i do play with like if afterward I'm going through a tough time, there there needs to be a spit, like I need to feel comfortable. There needs to be an openness and willingness on the part of all of us to listen. Um, because it will be your turn to talk at some point too. Um, I don't know, I, like you can do that sort of deliberately. Like you can say like, all right, every week we're getting together the br for brunch. And like this brunch is not about us like gossiping or whatever this brunch is about us like getting down to business we're we're, we're we're talking about all of it everything that we're going through I don't know how it, I don't know necessarily like that works for everyone but it, it, it is being intentional right like we have to be intentional about creating the spaces outside of the the institutions outside of the mental like the therapist's office where people feel comfortable talking to one another Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was in such a deep like like I had no plan, right? Like like I was I was, I have like mild hypochondria as well. So I was commit, like sure that like something else was wrong with me, that like I had cancer, that like you know, something, right? Um, so at 21 and like not having known anyone to like to actually say out loud they had depression, to go see a therapist, anything like that, like I wouldn't have done anything, right? And that is part of the problem, right? Like. I had been exposed to these ideas in like a psychology class in high school um, where I didn't take them seriously, right? Like that's something that happens to other people. That's something that's described in a textbook, right? Like that's, so I think it's important to, I mean, this goes for so many things, but it's important to talk about these ideas much earlier than people are exposed to them, right? Like I was not exposed to the idea of anxiety disorder, like that feeling that I got like every day as something that could be treatable. Um, I just thought, oh, I'm just the, that's just my personality. Like I'm just afraid of everything. Um, and then everyone had told me I was shy. So it was like, okay, well, I just don't talk to people about things. There needs to be a, a more of an education earlier than that so that people know that there are options. I didn't know there was an option. Did someone know very Yeah, I think um, I think this is a generation of activists that is um, more intentional uh, and more invested in the idea of self care, um, and that they know that there's a thing such, like there is such a thing as burnout. Like I can't keep doing this every single day. I do think though that there isn't there just aren't mechanisms in place to help with like what, what self-care looks like, right? Like so much of it just becomes sort of a market-driven thing where it's just like, go get a, a mani-pedi and like go shopping. And it's like, okay, retail therapy, like I'm not gonna knock anybody for it. I have hundreds of pairs of sneakers. Like I know what retail therapy is, right? But I do think that like that becomes another way of escaping and not dealing directly. Right, um, and I don't know, I think that there's like 
there's a level of interest that does not match the level of access. Um, that there, there's, there's not quite the. I mean, so much of it, it's just like, yeah, I'm an activist, uh, but also understand that I'm doing this in my spare time because I also work. <laughs> you know, and I, I, where am I supposed to draw these lines and how am I supposed to get any time away if I live paycheck to paycheck? Um, I can't book a vacation and just go and lay on the beach somewhere. Like that's just not a possibility for me. Um, I can barely afford, if I do, to go see the therapist, right? Like I think that there's just because, like there's, there's still stigma um, and there's, then there's still lack of resources that don't match the level of rhetoric uh, around caring for self. Um, and, and then there's just like, what am I supposed to do? What is that? What does self care even look like for me? I don't even, I don't, I've never been given the opportunity or the space to explore that. So I want to take care of myself. I want to be able to step away. I don't even know what that means to me. Um, so being able to provide people with the spaces for the exploration of that, um, I think, you know, it, there's, there's going to be that tension though, because these problems don't go away, right? Like, in part because we don't have the numbers, right? Like, if, if everyone decides to take a self-care day at the same time, it's just like, we don't have backups, <laughs> you know? Like, the, the system is entrenched and is entrenched because there are lots of people, like, helping that system perpetuate itself. And so, like, the number that always comes, like, that I always think about is, like, um, at the height of the civil rights movement. I mean, we're talking about the, the height. We're talking about the, that 1950s, 60s era, the height of the civil rights movement. 12% of black people were engaged in that fight, right? And, and so I think about the number one is like astonishing that they were able to accomplish that much with like 12% of black people, right? Like it was, we're not even talking about 12% of the entire nation, just 12% of black people engaged in this fight. I'm talking about people who show up to marches, people who uh, were part of organizations, uh, involved in civil disobedience and direct action, 12% of black people. That's an astonishing number, but also, if half of those people don't want to show up one day or like for six months because of self-care, like the number dwindles to a point that like becomes almost negligible, right? So there's the feeling that you're carrying so much more weight than what you personally can carry uh, or like feel capable of carrying, but you have to carry it because there's just not enough people involved in, in, this, in this activism. So. Like how do you, how to draw those lines is uh, one more people have to step up more people have to be engaged politically uh, on a level that feels like the numbers are there and that people can feel comfortable stepping away um, but also again being intentional about. Uh, talking to people about ways in which to care for themselves and giving them tools uh, and understanding that like it doesn't all have to be like retail therapy we, we can create new ways uh, like this is like does do you have a meditation room at the organizing meeting so that for 20 minutes like I can just because we're here for eight hours like can I just step out for 20 minutes and like go meditate like is that that's like just a simple thing that I, I just think about like but who thinks about that in the moment right like it has to be a part of the planning process
Yeah. I mean, the question is, I mean, I would turn back to you. It's like, what have you done to make yourself available, right? Like, I think that, that that's the thing is, resources exist somehow and then no one knows about them, right? Like, there are people, like, all of these all of you people in this room right now, I, I, I assume care. And then you ask me, like, how do I show that I care? Like, how do I show, like, how do I ally with these folks? And it's like, at what point have you made yourself available? Right, like what point have you called or like reached out to a local Black Lives Matter chapter or like folks who, who are doing other, other kinds of organizing work and said, hey, I understand like the need for, like I am a professional, like I am here to offer my services. And that, where is that part of it, right? Like I think that the, the, there's the, there's the expression of the need like happening on the part of the activists and then there's a there's a shrugging there's a being like man that that sucks for them that they need all of this stuff who's stepping who's going to step up and just say like okay i am here i i and i know i'm just one person but i'm at the very least i'm lending my services here um i think you know, again i'm a writer it's like to have some people write some op-eds saying like this is what I th this is this these are things that I think are helpful. Now it exists as a resource. Like doing re like I don't. My my whole thing is, is like um, again reiterating. I know my talents. I know what what how to make myself available. It's really getting over the idea that like people are supposed to reach out to you. Like, they, you have to offer for people, especially people who don't have a history of knowing about these resources or having access to them. They have to know that they're available and like that's on the parts of the institutions. Uh, are you a student, a med student? Yeah. That's a question for you to figure out. Like, you, like I think that that's something. That's an area of study for you to to say. Like, what what is that? What what does that look like? Do we need ter new terminology? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that that's. That, I mean, that's like what 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 stage of the process are you at? Okay. Well, the rest the half, the second half is all about you answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is get right here. How are the the the, the yeah. providers? Man, if you don't know. <laughs> Like, I don't know that I want to see you as a provider, right? Like, like I think that, like, there's, there's, you can't be, you can't be that educated <laughs> and not be aware of the state, right? Like, and that, that, that'd be a problem of the education, right? Like, that to me sounds like a problem of the education. If the focus, if, if that has never come into uh, a classroom or a tech leg, like if that has not come into play, that is a problem of the education process that you are like oblivious to the idea that, oh, systemic oppression exists, right? Like, like it does. <laughs> um, 
And so... Oh, who's in charge of the curriculum at Yale? Let me have a sit down with them. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think. The question, just because we can't, like, we can't actually hear what she's saying. So if you could just like summarize it or something. So. I will address it. Uh, so. I think that a lot of what, what's happening here is that people are siloed off into like their professional status, uh, they're, they're siloed off into uh, their worldview, right? Like, and it, no, everything is a collaboration. So yes, it, there, are, there are gonna be limits to the ways in which like the professional can like, can address traumas that are experiential and they're going to have to teach you. But that's part of, if I'm not mistaken, that is part of the process of like mental health care is that people are teaching you how to care for them, right? Like, like by sharing that experience. Um, and I think that what, what, what I then am advocating for is like the bringing of the knowledge to be able to say like, I'm hearing something new and now I'm researching this and I'm coming up with new terminology to like help you understand this experience and now we're talking back and forth and now I have that knowledge to go forth and talk to someone else about this and I think that we have to we can't dismiss the concept of community right like we are in community together and it's not like just because you're here at Yale studying medicine or like teaching it does not mean that you are separated from the community outside of this right like and there's a responsibility of community to care for one another and bring to bear the tools that they have to care for one another um, and so no you're absolutely right and but I think that what how to get over that is one, there, there has to be a curriculum shift if like people are not coming out of here understanding the state and state oppressions and, and different forms of different systems of oppression. Like that's just like, wow, what an abdication of duty, right? Like, um, and then there's, there's also um, just a, a, a way in which you have to see yourself in community with people who are not immediately next to you, right? Like I'm not, like my community is not just the people that I'm friends with, it's not just the people that I socialize with in the most immediate sense. Like we are responsible to one another as human beings. And like that sounds like very basic, but it's like we're not, we don't, we don't get the basics as Lil Wayne once said. Uh, you know, like we don't understand that we're we're still stuck there, and so we build up institutions that are propping up sort of like this intellectual veneer that are disconnected from from real life. What do we What do we think is going to happen? What do we think? Like this is the result. Right, let me get the question. Thank you so much for honesty. Uh, you talked about how like you know the
how they do it in Sandy Hook. Like, I don't think it's like it's so different, right? Like if there's if you already have experience doing it, like setting up the program, it's not so different. Right? We're still talking about people experiencing trauma. Like it is there is a level of understanding of like what racist violence looks like and how that that appears. And so you can't send people that don't know that there is state violence, right? Like you can't send those people. Um, but you do have. Uh, you have sort of an, an infrastructure there that knows how to go to these places of extreme violence and the, you replicate it and you adapt to the new circumstances. Like that's, that's what any program does. I don't know that I, I've ever become numb to the pain, uh, and I would start to worry if I did. Uh, but I do know that I have my limits of what I can consume. So the day that Mike Brown was killed, and I saw it unfolding on Twitter, it's just like, I can't do this. I can't do this for the next couple days. I know I'm going to have to write about it because like, that's just sort of the, the like, um, job of the black writer in the age of the internet is just like responding to every, uh, every act of state violence and like contextualizing it for white people. Um, but I can't do this right now. And when uh, Philando Castile and Alton Sterling were killed, uh, they were killed within like a week of one another. And that video of Philando Castile and his girlfriend and the young child, I couldn't watch that. I couldn't watch it. And, and I went on TV to talk about it and like they're playing it. And it's like, I can't watch this. I'm not watching another lynching. Um, I'm not numb to it. What I know is that I have to I have to care for myself, right? Like, I know what that is. I already know what it is. I don't need, I don't need to experience it again to know what it is. Um, so I, I'm not numb, I'm just constantly angry, right? And I was just reading um, Rebecca Solnit recently, uh, and she sort of is like, writing recently about anger um, and uh, how she finds it to be not as useful a, an emotion uh, for us as activists and like thinkers. Um, she's like, you know, obviously be, you can be, like anger exists, um, but it shouldn't be sort of the driving force because it too quickly turns to violence or hate. And it's like, I disagree on that point. Um, but I also should sort of disagree with her assessment um, in that saying that I anger is not useful because like the last sentence of an essay I just read from her is something to the effect of, uh, you know, using the use of anger is like just pour, it's like pouring gasoline on, on something. And like the effect of pouring gasoline on something is that, that it explodes. And she says that it's like it's a bad thing. I'm like, some things need to be exploded. <laughs> like some things just don't need to exist anymore. Like there are, there are systems and institutions that we need to be angry about and we need to then uh, dismantle. <laughs> and, like, and I think that anger is a good tool for, for like focusing on that. Um, so numb, uh, I, I hope I don't get numb. Um, I'm going to stay angry. <laughs> that are kind of broken out there, but I'm wondering if you have any, you know, any thoughts or 
and or for gasoline to pour on the mental health system itself or um, psychiatrists in this room, I'm sure. But, uh, but you know, just the, that perspective is the ways in which this system is complicit in perpetuating some of the oppression that you're talking about. So I'm, I'm going to pick up on what like you said as an aside and sort of like a joke is like not the psychiatrist in this room. And it's like, no, that's that's exactly it. Right. Like it is like not even sorry. It is you. Right. Like, like, like I'm not. <laughs> and I say that like because. I have a good friend named uh, Darnell Moore, whose book you should also pick up called No Ashes in the Fire. Right. And. Um, several years ago when I met Darnell, and we we're talking about these conversations around masculinity and like the black, black masculinity in particular and talking about that, they, the way that it intersects with white supremacy and talking about, and he said something that at the time I just never thought of, um, but now on, like sort of only use this as the framework of talking about specifically this thing where he said, it's easy to recognize whose boot is on your neck it is way harder to accept and recognize that your boot is also on someone else's neck, right? Like every one of us is complicit because every one of us draws some sense of power and privilege from a part of our identity. I stand before you as a cisgender heterosexual man and I know that those first two, like all of that means that I experienced some power and privilege that for much of my life has gone uninterrogated. And I'm constantly learning which parts of my behavior have been part and parcel of a system of oppression and which have denied other people access to their full humanity. I'm a part of that problem. And I have to take responsibility for that. And that is on me to examine that, is, is me to do that education and learn what the problem is, what I have done, and accept the, like, not only the responsibility, but the accountability, the accountability for repairing the harm. And so when you ask me this question, it is not about me even saying like what you've done wrong. It's like, there's literature letting you know what, what, what harm has been done. You know, like, hopefully, as like, you, hopefully that's part of the training, what, what's been done wrong. I don't, like, is it? Like, maybe, I don't know. I'm worried now, like, about the gaps in everyone's education here at Yale. Um, but it is, it is really about saying, no, the problem is not outside of me. The problem, I am part of a system, and I know that that system has been harmful, and I know that I, as a part of that system, am complicit in that harm. Now, how do I examine that? How do I fight back? And that's going to look different for every institution that we're in, every identity marker that, we're, we, that we have, that's going to look different. But it is, is cru the crucial first part is to say, it's like, stop abdicating the responsibility outside of yourself. It is to say, I am complicit in a system of oppression. Like that's hard and it's hard to accept, but that's the very first step. Oh, okay, I'm told we're done. So thank you very much, thank you.